honestly, it's an honor to present to students. So thank you. Um, we'll start this talk with a little introduction of myself, uh, what I do, and then learn the path of becoming a physician scientist. So we'll start with my name. You know my name. My name, it's right out there on the slide too. My name is Parthi Manwani. I'm a stroke neurologist. I work at Memorial Hermann at the Te Texas Medical Center and also assistant professor in the Department of Neurology here at University of Texas Health, uh, Houston McGowan Medical School. Uh, this is the place where I provide my clinical services via telemedicine outpatient clinic. I also do clinical research and um, run a basic science lab. And my lab is focused on stroke and dementia. So I'll talk a little bit about my research. Uh, oh, no disclosures. So something which is very close to my heart, no pun in that intended here, neurocardiogenic syndrome. Um, so what is neurocardiogenic syndrome? It is the heart brain cross drug. So I'll healthy human body has a strong heart and a strong brain, um, and they live in synergy. So what happens in a disease state? As med students, um, which I believe most of the crowd here is, uh, we all have seen patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage um, where they get takosubo cardiomyopathy. What is takosubo? It is the broken heart syndrome. So what happens is the heart muscles get stunned or kind of stressed and function less as a response to the hemorrhage in the brain. So the brain hemorrhage is talking to the heart and making it stressed. So again, a brain heart crosstalk. On the other side, um, are the patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, you all know that when there's a cardiac arrest, it's in the hospital or in the field, a CPR is done, then there's return of spontaneous circulation, then we cool the patients. And what do we do next? We call a neurologist. We ask the neurologist to comment or prognosticate on the extent of brain injury because the brain suffered the injuries which were caused when the heart stopped. Again, an example of a heart brain crosstalk. So these are just examples and not the only disease conditions where the heart talks with the brain and this crosstalk occurs. So let us look at how does a sick heart affect the brain? So my research really focuses on atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation and cardiomolic strokes. So what is atrial fibrillation? Most, most of you guys know, but just to recap, this is a normal heartbeat, a normal ECG. In atrial fibrillation, the atrium of the heart, which is here, fibrillates, which means vibrates instead of contracting. So instead of um, pumping blood down to the ventricles, there is vibration in the atria, and that atria then accumulates blood and forms clots, which go everywhere. And um, the most serious complication of atrial fibrillation is thromboembolism. Thrombo means formation of clots, embolism, that they move around. Embolic risk to the brain, which is called cardioembolism, is actually eight times higher than these clots going to the periphery, going to the foot. Uh, interestingly, AFib also increases the risk of dementia to by 30%, independent of the risk of stroke. So this is interesting to me because this is, again, a heart-brain crosstalk, uh, how a sick heart with atrial fibrillation is causing strokes. So the goal of my lab is to prevent cardiomolic strokes. And how can we prevent cardiomolic strokes? So let's take a tour of the lab, full disclosure, studies on AFib are very difficult, very cumbersome. Uh, a mouse heart beats 400 to 600 times per minute. So um, this is way more than a human. So EKG reviews and ECG reviews here and a day of telemonitoring takes several days of analysis. Okay, so what we, did we do? We take aged mice. These are males and females. We study both. We do not exclude females in our lab, um, which uh, most researchers do because um, one, it added, adds mice. Second, they are 
problems with cycling, but we study unanimously. These are agent mice, so these are not cycling. We induce AFib with drug or pacing, and you see here, this is the point, the heart was beating normally, we injected the drug, and now it is irregularly irregular. So there is atrial fibrillation. We implant monitors on these mice. We do telemonitoring, which means we monitor how much AFib burden is there. We do flow cytometry, where we study the immune cells. And then we sacrifice these mice and do histology, which is take sections and study different molecules, uh, more kind of uh, immunohistochemistry staining. So this is one of the data points we collected when we recorded males and females after that uh, injection. On the y-axis are the total number of AFib events. And as you can see, females had way more events than males after a similar induction. And these are aged non-cycling females, which resembles a postmenopausal above 70 year woman. So um, what we found is was not known, but what we knew actually that sex differences do exist in AFib and this is known, it is being studied. This was a paper in 2005, which shows like when you compare the cause of stroke in women versus men, I don't know if you guys can see the black bar here. It's way high above here uh, in women as compared to men. And these are the strokes caused by from the heart in women. Um, you guys probably know the CHADS2 score, which is used to stratify if a patients with high intermediate and low risk of cardioembolism or risk of stroke, just being a woman or a female is an automatic point in that score. Um, so if you are above a certain age and you are a female, you automatically qualify in the high risk category. So uh, we found something in the last slide along these lines that the women had, the females had more AFib burden. So ongoing studies in our lab are deciphering the underlying mechanisms more so uh, is there more inflammation which induces more AFib. So this is, was a little snapshot of the lab on uh, one project which we do, which is very uh, interesting to me um, and gives you an idea of what a lab looks like and what do we do in the lab, right? So let's talk about let's focus on the path of becoming a physician scientist. That's why we are here, right? I would start by saying that it is not easy. And so are not many good things, right? So getting to med school was not easy either, correct? Um, success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and a uh, Above all, love of what you're doing. Always remember that. Uh, if you don't like what you're doing, then we are done. Then there's no point of doing that. And I strongly believe in that and I actually preach that. So um, I like to show this ikigai. I don't know if you all are familiar with this ikigai concept. It's a Japanese concept meaning a reason for being. And um, this is the ikigai of profession. As you can see, profession is what you um, really think you are good at and what is a passion, what you love doing. And I want to stress the word passion here, uh, which I stressed before. If you're passionate about it, that's when you move to that path forward and you can be successful. You need to love what you're doing. Of course, there's this money factor, what can I be paid for? And that controls a lot of professions and that's valid, but passion is very important. So one part is done when you get to medical school. But the next question is, do you want to be a scientist too? Do you want to be a physician scientist? Because you all are almost, most of them are in med school, 
you guys all will be physicians for sure, right? Um, would you like to be a scientist? And if you're a scientist, what do you want to do? What do you do as a scientist, as a physician scientist? So, well, if you're a scientist, you mo do most translational re research. So you target mechanism, develop therapies based on preclinical information. You can validate preclinical targets in human populations. You can translate everything to tr clinical trials and you can have a better clinical de design. And it really helps to know both sides of the world. It helps to know the patient at the bedside and it helps to know the lab bench. To be honest with you, most of my research questions are born at the bedside. And I'm fortunate I know how to answer those questions at the bench. If, I, if a patient asks me something and I feel helpless because there are no treatments, there's no answer, and I just tell them that current research and current literature doesn't have answers to what you said, but maybe we will have answers to those one day. And then I just find a med student or an undergrad and we work on the project. Uh, oh, why is it not moving now? Do you guys still see the screen? Yeah, we still see the screen and it's on the translational research slide. Okay. I think, yeah, I think things are just a little bit laggy on Zoom today. Yeah. So let us see how you can tailor your career after you decide you need to go to medicine. So um, some people decide early, some people decide late. Um, most people who do MDs, they decide on a clinical pathway. Some people have already decided their careers uh, and say, I'll go to the research pathway and do an MD-PhD. So there are two tracks up front, right? An MD and an MD-PhD. This pathway of an MD-PhD is usually destined and the destiny of this pathway is um, going to an academic track. Um, assistant professor, going to associate professor and work on basic uh, clinical translational research. But you can see all these arrows everywhere. <laughs> so people go to everything. If you go on an MD pathway, you still have a chance to go to this pathway to go to academic research. How do you do that? You go to a residency of, with a physician scientist training program or a research and residency training program. There are a lot of T32, KL2 sponsored um, residencies and they will allow you to have a year or two of research and some ingrained research all throughout. Every resident has to do scholarship. There's not much time to do that. Um, if this is ingrained, you have to do it and then you become good at it. So those are the two pathways if you took the clinical pathway from the get-go. Now the blending happens, people, as I said, people do all sorts of things. So a lot of MD, PhD do go to plain residencies. They do not go to this track. They don't go to this track. A lot of MDs go to this track or this track. Then comes the fellowship. Um, the fellowship which you do can be clinical or it can be a clinical research fellowship. So suppose, for example, I did a stroke fellowship, a vascular neurology fellowship. So that's one year clinical. You can get done with that one year clinical, then you're done, you get board certified in, that's the minimum required by ABPN, correct? Now, if you want to do research, you also do a research fellowship where you spend your clinical year and spend a couple of years or an extra one year doing research and stroke so that you can be directed to this traditional academic track. The later you start, the harder it becomes, but it's not impossible. Um, some people actually, a lot of physicians I have seen, they start with a clinical pathway, they do MD, they go to a regular residency. And in fellowship, they decide, well, I'll tailor my fellowship, fellowship to research. They do a ton of research. 
build their careers from the fellowship. And it is not uncommon, not uncommon. That's why there's a black arrow. So um, once you're done with those training, now you need to decide what kind of a job you would do, right? Even if you did in a, an MD, PhD, you have all the, and that's the hardest one, right? Because you have been trained in science and from the beginning, and you have been trained in medicine from the beginning. So what do I do for a career? Do I do medicine or do I do science? Do I do both? And that's a question which everybody asks. So if you're asking that, it's not abnormal, that's totally normal. Um, so let us introduce you to these tracks with what a day in that career looks like, correct? So suppose you decide I'm going to be a pure clinician, which means you have no research time. You either go to outpatient, you open your own clinic, or um, you go to inpatient, become a hospitalist. You have one week on, one week off. So both in private practice, private small hospital, if you go to inpatient, you work by yourself, you are independent. You, um, when you are in the hospital, you provide your services to that hospital. When you're in a clinic, you are your autonomous body. You, in the clinic, you can bill for a procedure, increase your revenues. That clinician is, um, these are heavily paid jobs. Right, so because you are um, private, um, you the more you work, the more you get. Some people do seven on, seven off, and in their off time, they do locums and they get paid more. So you're basically making a ton of money here. How do you enhance your um, skills? You in your clinic or in your hospital can. Um, enroll patients in trials. So you can say, hey, this trial is going on. And one of the trials on clinicaltrials.com, you say, I can enroll patients for you, get paid for those. And you also become part of those papers. Um, and you can teach. You can even teach in a, clinic, uh, in a very private clinical setting. Like if you have your own clinic, you can invite med students, undergrads, residents to co come there for one day a week. Um, and the more you teach, the more you learn, and the more you disseminate the information. You have to become a mentor. So that's one pathway. The second pathway is of a clinician educator. So um, clinician educator is somebody who works in a clinic or hospital service like a pure clinician, but this is not private. This is a hospital which is owned by a university or a private group, but it has trainees, it has residents, it has fellows, it has medical students affiliated. So what you do is, um, if you are a hospitalist, you don't do all the work, the residents do it for you, they write notes, you teach, you teach, and you teach a lot. Um, if it is an outpatient, you have shadowing students, you have as part of the curriculum, you have residents, you have resident clinic, you have stroke fellow clinic, and you have med students of my favorites. You teach the clinical skills, you do case-based teaching, you tell the medical student, okay, tomorrow you will read up on uh, hypothermia protocol after cardiac arrest. 15 minutes talk, the residents learn, the med student learns, everybody learns right? You do bedside teaching and it all helps the medical students. It helps you. And it really, honestly, this is the part, the teaching is the part which um, always reminds me why I stay in academics, because I like teaching, right? And some people don't like it and they don't want to stay in academics. They do private practice and it's a choice. Everybody is different. And of course, as a clinician educator, you will have graduate students, you will have MPA student, um, master students who want to do research and they want to come see how patients are or enroll them in, in their own trials. So uh, in a snapshot, this is the life of a clinical educator. You Do you get paid less than a private? Probably, um, but it's a different lifestyle. 
and gives you more academic hook because you're involved with medical students. So what does a day in the life of a scientist look like? Like a pure PhD scientist, non-clinician. So they will either do a basic science or a lab-based research, or they are like clinical researchers who do epidemiology, a lot of um, statistics, um, data extraction, bioinformatics. And they can start with pharmaceuticals. They can work as co-investigators. They have to keep writing grants, get funding, look everywhere, publish papers. They teach. They do mentorship. They have postdocs. They have graduate students. They also have residence fellows, medical students rotating. You guys, most of you guys must have rotated in a lab in undergrad or in like a summer program. And people love that because it boosts up your CV and you learn more about research. But that's in a snapshot, a scientist, which you guys will not be because you are not pure PhDs. You already have an MD. The reason I'm showing you this because it takes us to this last step is what is the day in the life of a basic physician scientist? What do they do? So if you are a physician scientist uh, running a basic science lab, you have a lab, you have to manage a lab, uh, you have to manage the people in the lab, you have to make sure you have supplies, you need to make sure you have funding. Then you are also a clinician. You have to keep up with your skills, not get trusted. So you do inpatient service, you do your clinic, you have your divided time as per your contract or your agreement with the department. You can enroll in clinical trials. And yes, of course, my favorite part, you teach. You teach, get to teach everybody. Like at the bench, you get to teach at the um, in the hospital, you get to teach in the clinic, you can do resident clinic, you can do fellow clinic, you can do clinic with med students, you can do your clinical trial, separate clinic where you enroll your patients and still teach the nurse practitioners. So you get the full bundle, um, a ton of meetings and you have to triage which ones to go to because you are now a physician and also a scientist. So you have to do you have to do all the scientific meetings and you also have to do all the clinician meetings, which if you put them all on your schedule, you probably are doing meetings all day. So you have to triage. And the biggest part is mentoring. Uh, once you um, get to that point, um, you need to learn how, not only how to teach, but to get those people who are working with you uh, to the next step and mentor them to this pathway if they wherever they want to go. So when I started this um, career, I did have a ton of questions and did not really know if I should take this path or not. Why do I need to be a physician scientist? You know, I'm fine, I have an MD. Um, certain practical issues which come in is like, I'm going to be so old if I do it. I'm not going to get young. Nobody does. And then how to prepare and really see if this route is for me. I don't know if it will pay my debt. What if I'm not successful? Can I still have a life? And is this actually for me? That's the big question which everybody has. And uh, a lot of scientists, a lot of MD, PhDs, trust me, even if you not, not start with um, an MD, PhD track and you do a research fellowship only, you still get to all these questions. And um, that's the fun of it. So how to do it? Find a mentor first. Mentor is very important. The best mentors are the ones who are invested in you, not in themselves. So I found a mentor. This is the picture of my mentor, Dr. Louise McCullough, who, is, um, who mentored me during my PhD. She had been wonderful because um, 
even when I graduated, went off to residency fellowship, she would call me, she would visit, have meetings to keep me on track with research. And that's the time you can actually capture those physician scientists to come back to the academic track, because this is the time when you're doing a ton of clinical and your peers are mostly clinical and all of them are looking for jobs uh, in the clinical fields and you don't want to be different. Um, and if you have a mentor who almost always uh, tells you that you're different and you can do it and believes in you, um, that's when you make the right choices. So, Okay, so now you decided that you're going to be a physician scientist, you found a mentor, what do you do next? You have to find a job which will allow you to have a lab, right? And um, a job with clinical and having research time is difficult to get. Because let's think it this way the hospital or a university is not going to pay you if you do not generate revenues. You need to get your own salary up and running. They will not say, oh, come on, spend 50% of your time, do spend your time in the lab doing crazy ideas, uh, which they don't know it will work. It's a high risk situation, right? Um, and that's the time when you need to, if you're lucky and if you have a good background and you have published and that's where you show them, um, you give them evidence of success. And I have gotten through and many universities will believe in you, give you a startup, give you some lab time, but that's not long term. You have to get started and you have to secure funding. The funding which will pay for your research time, which will pay for your lab, um, which will pay your salary, which will pay the salary of your research assistants, which will pay for everything. So that's when the pressure starts. Um, I always try to like this Ikigai concept, and this is the Ikigai concept for academic success, the professional academic navigation diagram, the PANDA. And if you see on the top in the green, it shows the mentored or mentoring relationships. So you have to find a mentor. You can't start without a mentor. Somebody needs to guide you. Somebody needs to tell you what to do next. There are a ton of questions, tons and tons. And you can't, some people need more guidance than others, but there should be somebody available in your field to answer those questions. The relation should be purposeful, efficient, and there should be mutual respect. Then comes the research capacity. It, is it innovative? Is it impactful? Is it rigor? Does it have rigor? Is it collaborative? And are you producing enough papers in the field? Are you getting known in the field? The research capacity is important. And then, of course, grant success. And this is the point I want to mention that when you come out of fellowship, a lot of grants are available, which are called career development grants. These are designed to be high risk grants. These are designed to be grants which are supposed to be given to people who are coming right off training. And they, they actually pay your salary for your research, pay for your lab, they pay for all the resources, under the mentorship of a mentor. If they write a letter that I'll continue to mentor because what they are doing is they are investing in you. They are relying on your prior achievements and giving you the money, but they want to see if you also have a mentor, what if something falls apart will hold you. That mentor will hold you and the mentor writes the letter the chair of the department writes a letter supporting you. And those are available through the American Academy of Neurology, through the American Heart Association. They have a nice career development award. Um, NIH K-Tracks, 
um, all like I was applying for a K-8. I got the American Heart Association Career Development Award, which was a blessing actually. And um, it keeps you going because that's the beginning, right? So you need a starting point. And these grants are the starting points. If you have this grant, a university shouldn't have, actually shouldn't have much hesitation getting you on board as a faculty with some research time. So, okay, fine. Now you got through your writing grants, you got some career development grants. So before you were a leader, success was all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, the success is all about growing others. So you have to move the field forward, correct? Um, you have to train more physician scientists and that's what we are doing here. Um, we want a lot of you who are just in MDs, Many of you are also doing MD, PhD programs probably, but a lot of you who are just doing MDs to be convinced to a physician scientist career. Because you know what? The physician scientist is vanishing and it's, it's the reality. And why is this a reality? So look at this, we, I showed you this uh, pathway, but look at this, Guard, this garden hose with leaks. It's leaking everywhere. There are several places where we lose our physician scientists. Even if you start off, excuse me, as an MD PhD, you PhD was hard. You had a lot of depths. Now you have a family. I don't want to do a physician scientist track. I want to do a plain residency fellowship to the clinical track. I'm done. I don't want to deal with it a lost opportunity. A um, lot of people are lost in residency and they realize that residency with research is hard and they don't do it anymore. The physician scientist training program is not easy and we lose a lot of people just to do mentorship and a lot of clinical responsibilities. And then even if you do a like a resident, research in residency or a PSTP program, you may still decide to do the clinical track based on the opportunities available. And to be honest with you, what if you reach the traditional academic track, you are in a university, you have a lab of your own, you are in there with a career development grant year two, still, still looking for an independent big grant, you may leave. <laughs> and go back to clinical track. So there are leaks everywhere. And this was a nice article um, by NIH um, task force, which said, talked about the challenges facing the physician scientist workforce. It says key factors that put pressure on early career physician scientists include impact of research funding. If you don't get funding, the university will say bye-bye. And then you go to your clinical track. Um, length and structure of training, that the PhD is long. The PSTP programs are longer. So do you really want to spend so many years to do that? And the depth, research upfront doesn't pay too much. And work-life balance include integration, including leave policies, family life, childcare, influence of the mentor. There's always a tension between clinical and research responsibilities. Then you have, if you do too much research, can you maintain your board certification, especially as a neurosurgeon? Um, you have to keep up with your clinical skills, otherwise you lose. So this is a figure um, really copied from a paper, PNAS, which was published and it shows um, the age variation of R01 grantees. So R1 is the independent grant. That's the grant you need to have to establish your career as a physician scientist. You can have career development awards and a bunch of other things, but this is the grant which you want to keep you going. It shows in the started line how the age of the first funded R1 has gotten up and up. 
And it's still going up. The recent figures are like here. So if you, if you are a junior faculty, 38 years old, got career development award, and you don't grant grants for three to four years, what are you gonna do? The university will say bye-bye or will give you a warning. But you know, you, we can't keep paying you if you don't get your own funding. And then you get depressed and then you move on to the clinical track and you find happiness there. But what did we do? We lost a clinician scientist after so many years of training. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, this is challenges of a woman physician scientist. This is not the focus of the talk right now, but I'll just mention it, that it becomes even harder when the physician scientist is a woman or is somebody from a minority. It's mostly, as you can see, the top issue is work-life balance and whether the balance will flip if you take this pathway. It's not just valid for being a physician scientist. To be honest, just being a physician, just being a clinician, educated track, just being clinician in a private practice. So this is, this is pervasive all throughout, but not the topic of this talk. So we'll just keep it short and highlight, yes, that this issue also exists. I would recommend you all read this if you want to be going to the physician scientist track. Um, and this also highlights that really there are joys, but there are challenges. And what is not challenging? Every, everything is. So I'm not telling you it's very hard, um, but every, nothing is easy. You may ask me, it seems hard. What should I do? Dr. Manwani, you're telling me <laughs> the physician scientists are disappearing. You're telling me it's very lucrative, but then I may get uh, kicked off anytime. So what should I do? I would say find scholarship in your daily activities. Start now, start early. Your research or scholarship should follow from your daily activities. You're going to do those activities at, as a medical student anyways. Identify your colleagues as your collaborators, your co-med students, your senior medical students, your residents, your fellows, your junior attendings, a basic science researcher who is actually rounding with you in the unit identify them, get involved with an ongoing project. It will need a little effort from your side. Everything is not laid down on the plate. You have to put the effort. Get a mentor, identify them. They are around you. You will know who that person is while you round with them, while you are on your rotation, when you are in clinic. Somebody who will champion you develop a small pilot project. It can be very tiny, it can be a two month project, even a QI project and publish. This builds up your CV, publish even case studies, even case reports, brief reports. You see an interesting case in clinic, Say, ask your mentor or your clinic attending, tell your resident, it's interesting, would you like to publish it? And they may say, well, this has been published like a thousand times. Okay, my bad. Maybe we should uh, think about what is not published. Maybe we should find something interesting teaching point in this because as a medical student, we I learned a lot from this. So you can work in that direction too. And that identify mentors. They get so many, like I get invited reviews and I don't want to do them, but I want some trainee to write it and then I can edit it. And um, it's a good opportunity for you to learn a topic and then again, build your CV and make yourself stronger on that aspect for getting funding because all this is as looked at. When I review your application for an AHA Career Development Award, I would I, I would fund a candidate who has shown 
um, success from the beginning and has grabbed small opportunities to do some research and has written a case report, which gives me a track record. This candidate will perform well, and this candidate will stand above and beyond others. Okay, so things which I have learned. Perseverance. My first grant got rejected. Cried a little bit, move on. Write the second one. <laughs> Keep writing. <laughs> one day it will get funded. Don't get frustrated. That's the fun of get being a physician scientist. You can switch. The moment you are uh, troubled by why the echoes on the stroke patients wouldn't be done on a Sunday, uh, and you have this whole fight with the nurse practitioners and everybody and the hospitalists, and then you're so frustrated, and then the next day you go back to your lab and you're so relaxed and you feel like, okay, that's a change in environment. And then the experiments are not working, everything is crashing, and then somebody threw away your samples and this new person did this. And then the next day you are on service and you forget everything. And that's the time to refocus. And that switch keeps me going, actually, and um, makes me more engaged. And actually, just being in the clinic gets me more ideas. And I, as a physician scientist, would have um, felt helpless if there were questions which came across my way. And I did not know how to look for their answers. I feel privileged that I can, uh, I have the technical ability to be able to answer those questions in my lab. Let's look at it. What happens to this? Let's look at it. Do you want to do it? Yes, I want to do it. Okay, come to the lab tomorrow. <laughs> so that's how projects start. And always remember why you love academics. There is some flexibility in the research. Remember, you can do your experiment at night. You can write your paper at midnight to 4 a.m. Um, if your child is sick in the morning, you know, in the, in the clinical world, that's not the case. You're supposed to start service at 8 a.m. Your child is sick, you're not, definitely not be forgiven. You need to find coverage. Um, there is novelty in research. You find joys in little things which you discover. And then there is lifelong learning. Um, and always remember, you can do it all, just not at the same time. And the path is difficult, but again, nothing is easy. And difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. And I think um, the track for being a physician scientist is, um, is really amazing. And I, if anybody needs any help and wants to go to this pathway, it's not really in an MD-PhD track, it's really on an MD track, reach out, reach out to me. Happy to mentor you guys, uh, happy to get you hooked up to the right people so that um, you get on that track. Because that's part of my job, to move the field forward. All right, so I can't see any questions. I think I'll have to stop sharing, right? Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.